All right. So, good morning. Good morning. Uh, love you guys. I hope you're doing well. Okay. So, <laughs> let's. We're in First Peter chapter one, and uh, in just the opening verses. And you know, one of the things when we went through um, a few years ago, when we went through the letter to the Ephesians, right, six chapters long. I mean, we spent a year and a half going through the letter to the Ephesians and, you know, just every one week at a time. Um, obviously, when we go through a small epistle like this, we can, we can kind of slow down. We don't have to hit large chunks, um, and we're, we're hitting it every day. So, you know, even if we were to do, um, you know, over the course of, if I were doing half a chapter a week, um, we would get through it in two and a half months. I think we'll do it faster than that. But just so you know, uh, I don't know. Because this morning I have, like, by the time I got done, you know, I got 12 pages of notes, and we're not going to go through 12 pages of notes today. So we're going to go as far as we can. And what I really am going to be committed to is trying to keep this within, um, within a good time frame. So if I... Um, because I don't want to have long times every day. So on that note, let me, let's, get, let's get going. Um, so if I just get one verse today, I just get one verse. But all right, <clears throat> First Peter 1 Peter 1.1, just repeating, Peter, an emissary, uh, an apostle, sent out one um, of Messiah Yeshua. And what you, it says, to the sojourners of the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen. And again, chosen is actually right after. It's Peter, an emissary of Messiah Yeshua, chosen, or to the chosen, to the sojourn, chosen. Peter's a chosen, and the sojourners are of the diaspora are chosen. Um, and so now, typically, diaspora, the dispersed, the scattered ones, uh, uh, in general, if you're outside of Israel, you're considered to be in diaspora. Right, so that's a, a general understanding would be to those to the Jews that are outside of Israel, and it would apply to those scattered throughout the world, or here to the believing to the believers. Um, and so that may very well have been a very general understanding of who Peter was talking to. Um, but it's also uh, it's not unlikely that that the people that he he was writing to were mostly. Jewish believers, I mean, some would have been Gentiles, um, but mostly Jewish believers who have been expelled from Rome, who have been um, sent as, uh, who have been expelled because the emperor is wanting to colonize, right? We talked about this yesterday. The idea is, as the Roman Empire expanded, uh, they wanted to colonize. They wanted to, to spread Roman culture, Roman language, Roman institutions, um, and, and, and to have, and then to have mil and commerce to open up commerce to have military installations on the edges of the empire, um, and so people who kind of were stuck in their social standing within Rome, they could really get get ahead by choosing to go and help colonize um, some of these newly conquered lands. Um, but when you know, when you go to a place where people already are and you say, hey, we're here to take over, you're usually not well received. Well, those people who chose to go, Romans who chose to go to places like um, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, um, those who chose to go there, they, you know, they went with citizenship and they were protected. Um, but also there were those that were expelled. And during the reign of Claudius, um, he expelled Jews on multiple occasions, and he didn't make the same distinction that that was later made between Jews and who didn't believe in Yeshua and Jews who did believe in Yeshua. They just saw the group as a whole as being somewhat problematic and troublesome, um, and so they would be. There were um, times where they were expelled from. Rome, the historian, I mentioned this yesterday, I'm going to fly through this, but he tells us, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, and that probably is a version of saying Christ, um, Claudius expelled them from Rome. So he's like, you know what, I'm tired of you guys talking about this, arguing about it, just go, all of you out. Um, and so, so you've got this idea, Peter's writing to these who are 
outsiders who are um, sojourners, and they're, they've been expelled. Now, whether or not they specifically have been, whether they're sojourners like we're sojourners, um, they're in a place where they, the idea is they're likely in a place where they don't want to be. None of the other letters really address the people as being exiles and sojourners in the way that, the, that Peter's letter here does that. So they're exiles, right? They're not, they're not wanted. Um, Rome doesn't want them, uh, so they've been tossed out. Um, the people that are, that are natives to the areas where they've been sent don't want them. They, they're viewed as outsiders, as in invaders. Um, and then on top of that, they would have been despised by unbelieving Jews who think, man, you guys are the source of all of our problems. Because of you, because of you and your preaching of, of Yeshua, th- this, is, this has caused the problem and it's, it's put us all in a bad place. And so now, and so there's this hostility even uh, there. They are in a really difficult place. They're going through a d- very painful time. And, they, and it, you feel like, wait, God, if this is you, if this is, why isn't any of this going easier? If, if we're being obedient to you, why are we here at the end of the world in, you know, in Pontus, in Cappadocia? Why, why are we here? And, and those areas are basically in modern day Turkey. And Peter's writing them this letter as in a pastoral way. Um, you'll remember Yeshua had instructed him. Uh, feed my lambs, tend my, tend my sheep. And, and Peter, who, according to history and tradition, he had been in Rome on, you know, for long occasions on, on several, several times, and he ended up dying in Rome. Um, but so he would have been a, he would have been a pastoral figure, um, an overseer um, that these, that many of these exiles New. And so he writes to them. And like I mentioned yesterday, all five of the, sit- the places that he mentions, those were areas that were colonized by Claudius during this time. We talked yesterday about, you know, here's one, here's Peter, who's an apostolos, a sent one, dispatched. He's been sent by Yeshua, chosen, right? He's been chosen. And, and Yeshua told him, You'll, you're chosen. You're going to go to places you don't want to go. You're going to be in a situation you don't want to be in. Uh, John 21, verses 18 and 19, Yeshua says, Amen, 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 I tell you. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself, walk wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Now this he said to indicate by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. And after this, Yeshua said to him, follow me. Right, so it wasn't like, hey, everything's always going to be great and easy, and it's follow me. There's going to be times where you're going to go places you don't want to go. There was a time you got to go where you wanted to go when you wanted to go, but there comes a point where you're going to be in a place you don't want to be. You've been chosen for this. Follow me, and so that's Peter's story, and so he understands being in a place you don't want to be, and so he says, "I'm chosen. You're chosen." You're chosen to be in this place. Um, chosen by the, the summons, by the will of the Lord. Um, and it says, according to the, the foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God, of the Father, of God the Father. You're not here by accident. The Lord knew you'd be here. Uh, your Heavenly Father has chosen you for this time in this place. It's not an accident. It seems like it seems like it's by unhappy chance or by bad circumstances, but you're right where you're supposed to be for such a time as this. The Lord knew you're terrified, but don't be afraid. Um, So you're a sojourner. uh, You're an exile from one exile to another. And um, so he continues, according to Again, according to the knowledge of, foreknowledge of God the Father. God knew you were going to be here. And now there are three prepositional phrases. Um, there's according to the knowledge, foreknowledge of the Father. And then uh, the second one is in or by the Spirit. The, the Greek word is en. And then the third one is ace, into or for 
obedience and sprinkling with blood of Yeshua the Messiah. Verse 2, it says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart by the Ruach, by the Spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of Yeshua the Messiah. So that first part is, you, this was, you've been set apart, you've been set here, placed here, the Father knew, and the Spirit has, has put you here. There's a sanctifying work that is happening in this place, in exile, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, in China, in Iraq, in Iran, in the American pandemic. You're in, in, in exile the Spirit is doing a sanctifying work in you. This, the Lord knew, and the Spirit is at work. Um, look, the Spirit even did this to Yeshua. You're, in Mark 1.12, uh, after Yeshua was baptized, it said, that instant the Spirit, uh, ekbale, thrust him, threw him out. <laughs> is what it, ekbale is a, is a pretty intense word. He, he wasn't just quickly ushered into the wilderness. The Spirit thrust him, drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. Um, and so, so the, the Spirit is doing a sanctifying work, often thrusting us, as he did if Yeshua was thrust into a wilderness. Do we think we won't be thrust into a wilderness by the Spirit, according to the foreknowledge of the Lord? And for the purpose here, there's a purpose. It's not, it's, it's all happening, it's all going on, the Lord has has a purpose behind it into obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. So, so that for the purpose of, ace is a, can mean into, but it can mean for the purpose of as well, for the purpose of obedience and for the sprinkling of the blood of Messiah Yeshua. Now, immediately when you hear that, obedience and the sprinkling of the blood, there's, there's, there would have been imagery that would have come to mind um, among these believers. And again, most of them are likely at this point Jewish believers who've been expelled. But the, imp the understanding, by the way, is the expectation is that wherever they've been planted, whether in Pontius, Cappadocia, Galatia, you know, um, Bithynia, Asia, wherever they've been, that they are bringing the good news, that they're bringing good news to the afflicted, healing to the hurting, sight to the blind freedom to the captive, that that's what they're doing. And so the, the, the impact of that would be Gentiles in those regions coming to the Lord. Again, remember, think about this. The Holy Spirit, Paul wanted to go, remember in Acts 16, Paul wanted to go to Bithynia. He was going to go and to Mysia and Bithynia, and the Lord said, and the Spirit stopped him from going. Well, Why? We don't get the answer to why. It's just, Paul doesn't, isn't told why. Paul gets a dream saying, go to Galatia, go, or to Philippi, excuse me, go to Philippi. And yet, the Lord is going to fill this place with others, with other exiles, with others who are being sent. They think they're being thrust from Rome. They're being thrust out of Rome. What are we supposed to do? We, we like it here. This is our place. And the Lord says, no, you, you now, I have a purpose for you in a place you don't want to go. And he told, and the Holy Spirit told Paul, no, I have somewhere else for you to be. I've got people coming here. Somehow the gospel got to these places. And these people are in this place for such a time as this. This is according to the Lord knew what he was doing, set apart, sanctified by the Spirit, and for obedience and, for the, and, and, and uh, for the sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua. For this, the, and again, there's an imagery here for these Jewish believers and for the Gentiles that are coming in to know the word of the Lord. In Exodus 24, um, verses 1 through 11, we read that it says, then, Moses, then to Moses the Lord said, Come up to Adonai, you and Aaron, Nadab and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone is to approach Adonai, but the others may not draw near, nor are the people to go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of Adonai as well as all the ordinances. All the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Adonai has spoken, we will do. So you have the picture of obedience. We, it's a promise of obedience. We will do, right? We will shema. We will hear and do what he said. 
So Moses wrote down all the words of Adonai, then rose up early in the morning and built an altar before the mountain, along with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He then sent out young men of B'nai Israel who sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings of oxen to Adonai. Then Moses took half of the blood of the altar and put, excuse me, half of the blood and put it in basins and the other half he poured out against the altar. He took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Again, they said, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. Right, so there's obedience and you've got the sprinkling of the blood of the covenant. Then verse, verse eight, here's the, 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 then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, behold the blood of the covenant, which Adonai has cut with you in agreement with all of these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadav, Anavihu, oh, my, my computer's not plugged in and it's about to die. Hey, Anton, will you come plug this in? I just got a notific- notification. Um, then, uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. And 70 of the elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel and under his feet was something like a pavement of sapphire as clear as the very heavens. He did not raise his hand against the nobles of B'nai Israel. So they beheld God and ate and drank. So they they make this vow to do and obey all the Lord has spoken. And the blood of the sacrifice, the sacrifice was done, poured on the altar, and then taken and sprinkled on them. And then it closes with this sense of relationship. It says they beheld God and they ate and they drank, right? And of course they didn't do and obey all the words. Right? They, that's, that's why they ended up being ultimately scattered in the first place, which we went through in the book of Jeremiah. They didn't obey time and time again. They didn't obey. And so, and so the Lord scattered them, and not for the purpose of destroying them, but for the purpose of sanctifying them, for the purpose of making them clean, of purifying them, of making them whole. Um, and so you have this imagery of the Lord in First Peter, speaking to exiles and talking about the, uh, the obedience and the blood, uh, the sprinkling of the blood. And then, and you also have this imagery then of the word of the Lord given through um, one of the prophets who was in exile. Ex- uh, Ezekiel 36, speaking to exiles, speaking to the sojourners, the Lord says, I will take you from the nations gather you out of all the countries and bring you back to your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. So there's a sprinkling here, it's of water. And you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws so you will keep my rulings and do them. Then you will live in the land that I gave to your fathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. So they had not been able to obey and he says, I'm gonna give you a new heart. I'm gonna put my spirit within you. My spirit, because my spirit is within you, you will now, you will be transformed. You will then be able to, I will cause you to walk in my ways. There will be obedience. And so, and so he says now to the exiles, you have been set here. You have been put in this place, and there's something the Lord is doing, right? And, and you've been set apart by the Spirit, sanctified by the Spirit. You're being made holy by the Spirit in or, for the purpose of obedience and for the sprinkling of the blood of the covenant, the cleansing of your sin. Um, and then he gives the greeting, may grace and shalom be multiplied to you. Um, charis mean grace to you and peace uh, increasingly multiplied. Um, so this is not just a greeting here. It's a prayer. It's a blessing. Um, the word grace, charis, yeah, we, you know, we always know um, if you, the traditional, the theological definition of grace. If you would ask anyone in Bible school, freshman, you know, or in, in uh, some theology class that you took, in a, in a congregation, maybe, what is grace? And grace is the unmerited favor of God. And that's true. That's true in, in that it is the favor of God and it's unmerited. And yet there's a, there's a greater fullness to what grace expresses scripturally. 
that's not captured in that definition. Um, so we get from um, Ephesians 2, 8, 4, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, right? So that what saves us is grace. It's not from yourself, it's the gift of God. Um, so really what you see, the way grace is expressed in Scripture, is it's, it's, this, it's a divine empowerment. It's a supernatural empowerment. It's the power of God. It's not human. It's not, it's not of human strength. It's not of human origin. It's, it's a power, a strengthening from God. And so when you look at it, the operational power from God, this divine strength of God, it's his power at work. Then within, even within Ephesians 2.8, you know, it says, by, for by God's supernatural power, by God's strength, you have been saved through faith, through trusting in him. This is not from yourselves. This strength is not something you could muster up. It's a gift from God. It's his power. And so, so when he's talking to and praying and giving this blessing over this congregation, and he says grace and peace to you, he's saying, it, you know, may the strength of God be upon you. We use this word in this way colloquially, by the way. Sometimes we'll say when we struggle to do something or we face a situation which we just seem to have failed to pass the test, we'll say, you know, I just didn't have the grace for it. I just didn't have the grace for it. And what we're expressing is I just didn't have the power, the strength outside of my, beyond my own natural power. I didn't have what it took to overcome that. Um, well, that's kind of the language that it's this, when you say grace and peace to you, he's not saying unmerited favor of God because that's already understood that these who are believers have the unmerited favor of God. Um, but what he's praying over them is that in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your trial, that you will experience the power of God, that you will experience the peace of God that passes understanding. And then he prays this, verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, right? So this is, the language here is a little strange at first when you first read it, because it's, it's, it's a, this, first of all, it's a blessing. So the word for bless, to bless is the word we use for uh, eulogy, eulogios, uh, eulogitos, uh, meaning good word, a good word. Um, it's, only, it's only used, I think, about eight times in the New Covenant Scriptures, and it's always used uh, referring to God, um, not to man. And it's kind, of, it's kind of like the Jewish usage of blessed be he, blessed, you know, baruch, uh, blessed, blessed be the Lord. So, um, but what can be confusing about the language theologically for us is that it says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord uh, Messiah Yeshua. And... Uh, so to say he, that he is the God of Messiah Yeshua is to seem to reduce the divinity of Yeshua to somehow lesser than. Father and son don't, don't necessarily do that, but, um, but to say that he is the God of Yeshua in that regard could be confusing. Here's the deal, is that in Greek, you put the the article ha, the, the O, the article, is put in front of the word theos. So it says the God, but you don't necessarily translate the there. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like when you, it's, it's saying, I mean, with God gets the, the, God gets the article. It's kind of a royal treatment of his name, of who he is. So blessed be God, uh, even the father of our Lord Messiah Yeshua would be a clearer translation. Uh, transla translation, excuse me. Um, and so, blessed be God, who is the father, who is the father of, the, of our master, of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, the Messiah. In His great mercy, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Messiah Yeshua from the dead. So, it, it actually. It doesn't open up within his great mercy. Bless, pray, blessed be the God, blessed be God, uh, who is the father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, the one who, according to his great compassion, according to his great mercy, and the word used for compassion or mercy here um, is when it's, it's the word um, eleos, and when uh, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, eleos is the, 
the Greek equivalent of the, the translation for chesed. So the love of God, the covenant faithfulness, the loyalty of God. When you read the, in the Greek version of uh, Exodus 34, 8, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, where, uh, overflowing in chesed and mercy or, and truth, the word for chesed is translated here, eleos. So according to his chesed, his great love, the one who, according, he has caused us to be born anew. He has begotten us anew. He has he is brought us to, begotten us anew into new life. Um, so the, the, uh, and, the, and the focus, I'm going to skip some of the technicalities here, but the focus of Peter here is this. Um, the focus of the, ble- blessed be the God of the Father, the, the God, blessed be God, who is the Father of our Lord, who in his great chesed, he has given us new life. So we've been born anew. And Peter is the only one that uses this particular word for born again, uh, anagenesis. Yeshua in John 3.3 3 uses says something similar but slightly different where he says, genethe anothen, which means begotten from above, uh, born from above. But it's the same idea. And so, so the whole idea of new birth is hope and newness, right? I mean, it's, it's when you have a baby, there's, it, it's, it's hope. There's a chance for, for newness and for life. And, and so when he's made, we've been born anew. Um, there, he's pointing forward. He's pointing forward and says, we've been born. He's caused us to be born again to a, a hope that is living or a living hope, a hope of life, um, uh, into a hope of life, into a vibrant, a hope of a vibrant life. And hope is that which is certain, that which you can't see, but that which is certain. So though we are dying, though we are scattered, though we are suffering, we rejoice, we bless the Lord because we have been born into anew into a hope that is not dying, but a hope that is living, a living hope. And again, that fits the birth, the new birth analogy because being born isn't, isn't the culmination of something. It's the beginning of something. It's the, it's the commencement of something. We are, you, you're, you know, we always think of actually, you know, when you graduate high school or graduate from anywhere, we call, it's actually called commencement, which doesn't mean something has concluded. It means something is beginning. Um, that this stage is over and now something, this has all been preparing for this to go forward. So this new birth is commencing us, bringing us into now a new life. The new birth leads to new life, a living, a life of a, a hope, a certainty that is living, um, that is vibrant. And so it's not a desperate holding on to a faded dream or a dead hope, but it's a living one. When Peter speaks, when Peter speaks of we, we read very quickly often through, you know. He caused us to be born again to a living hope, to a hope that is vibrant, that is alive through the resurrection of Messiah Yeshua from the dead. Now, you have to remember how very real the resurrection, I mean, it's very real, but the hope of the resurrection, um, Peter's experience, what that meant to him. You know, here, here he knew what it was to seem for everything to seem its darkest. He knew what it was when all of his hopes and dreams, three years traveling with Yeshua, having visions of grandeur about what it was going to be in the kingdom, and now he's been given the keys to the kingdom, and this is going to be amazing. And he doesn't know what to do with, you know, in Matthew 16, 21, where after, you know, where Yeshua says that he's got to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the ruling Kohanim and the Torah scholars and be killed and be raised on the third day. And that's where Peter goes, never should it happen. He didn't hear the raised on the third day. He doesn't know what to do with that. All he can focus on is the killed and su- the suffering and the be killed. And Yeshua says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. And so Peter, on that, when, when he went through that, his... I mean, the failure of his, of, of the denials. And he wept bitterly. You know, he, he, 
he was broken over his, his own sense of betrayal, the recognition that Yeshua knew, Yeshua called it. And those days, can, I, I can't even imagine how dark those days after Yeshua's death were. No one, he, he didn't have in mind that there was a, a, this was going to end in three days. He didn't see the certainty of the hope that Yeshua had been, had been speaking of continually. He didn't grasp it. But now he understands. And so when he speaks of a certain hope and he points to the resurrection, he can remember walking through the darkest season when it seemed absolutely hopeless, but the resurrection that Yeshua had spoken of was certain to come, and it did come. And so he now says, and just as certainly as that happened, there you have been born anew into a living hope, into a hope of life. So in the midst of the darkness, that's, that's where the focus is. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to honor my word here, and I'm going to pause, and we'll hit the, the next couple of verses tomorrow. We'll get to verses 4, because it continues to talk about this hope um, with verses 4 and 5. Um, but we'll hit this tomorrow, because I still have half, half of it left. All right, so uh, I hope, hope you're not disappointed. But I, um, I, just, I just, I know that wherever the Lord has us, it's not always where we want to be. And he tells us things in advance. But we don't know what to do with those things. There are times the Lord gives you a word in general and we perceive it through, a, through our own lenses of the, the things of man versus the things of God. And we can't see that he's been saying all along that this would happen. I'm gonna suffer, I'm gonna die. He tells Peter, you're going to be taken to places you don't wanna go and you're gonna be led to talk about the kind of death that he would die. Peter's like, what about him? What about John? Not that your concern. I'm not talking about John. I'm talking to you. How come, can you imagine? Imagine what, I wonder what believers in China, if they've wrestled with that, saying, how come believers in America get it so easy? You know, what about them? How, what, I wonder what believers in Egypt or believers in, in Iraq or Iran in, in the Middle East have had to deal with. And they go, man, what about, what about these believers in the United States? And sometimes I think we're, we're a little soft. And just a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of losing a little bit of our, uh, the normalcy of the things that we like, everybody starts to fall apart. And these people are literally dying for their faith or, or uh, you know, that, I mean, there's so much they're going through and the Lord wants to produce something in us, set, setting us apart into the season to bring us to a place of greater obedience, to walking in who he's called us to be. He knows he's had, he has us here for such a time as this. Right here, he knew, he's set us apart here and he's doing a work in us. So we have to keep our focus on him and keep praising him and keep worshiping him, keep our eyes set on the living hope that he has, that he'll bring us through we may still go into darker days. I don't mean to be, but there still may be even darker days. But even in the darker days, there is a certainty of a hope um, that is certain to go on forever. This is temporal. This is short, and that is forever. So we fix our eyes. We fix our eyes on the hope. Amen? Thanks, everybody. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Grace and peace to you in Messiah Yeshua. Amen.